Okay, well, good morning. Uh, again, this is Ted Janik. Hi, everyone. I had a short welcome at the start of the conference. I'm here with, uh, with Graham Henderson from Shell. He is, he's their head of shipping. Um, we're going to have a little one-on-one -on -one conversation about uh, how, um, how Shell is looking at the changing environment for the shipping industry. Uh, the steps that they're taking, the activities they're involved in as a company to bring the uh, bring the industry forward in its uh, decarbonization uh, path. Um, I'm very I'm very pleased and I'm and I'm honored to uh, to sit with Graham and 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 have this conversation. I will say very briefly, Graham was just the other day awarded uh, an order of the British Empire uh, for his services to the uh, to the international shipping industry. Um, which, which, which is no doubt an honor, and and, and speaks to the uh, speaks to the involvement both of, of, of the individual and 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 the company. Uh, so, um, Graham, I'm going to um, I'm going to start by uh, kind of asking you a pretty a pretty broad question, uh, if you if you will. What what kind of what kind of initiatives has Shell been taking uh, in working with the shipping industry uh, over the last 12 months? Uh, to address uh, the challenges that are that are that are coming. Well, firstly, Ted, it's it's great to be talking with you, and and also to be um, with the New York Maritime Forum uh, again. I I well remember a couple of years ago being in New York, and it's um it's the most uh, fabulous uh, event. So I, I feel very privileged to to be here with you. Um, in terms of Shell and working with the shipping industry and the challenges ahead. Um, I think the forefront of our minds is, um, is coronavirus, which has been a major challenge for us all. In fact, we were just chatting about it um, before we came uh, online. And we've been working closely with um, the industry to overcome some of the challenges around particularly crew changes. And I am pleased to say that we've now completed on our shell ships over 90% of the crew changes. Um, it's taken quite some effort. Um, more than 120 crew relief operations in over 25 locations around the world. But um, we're very pleased with that and are continuing to push forward with the industry. Hmm. We're also pushing forward with safety, technology, digitalization, and decarbonization. And on safety, we've recently launched Together in Safety to unite the shipping industry as one global team from ship owners, ship managers, ship builders, through to industry groups, classification societies, and uh, P&I clubs. And I believe that we will start to see a real shift in the industry's safety performance. Hmm. On decarbonization at Shell, we've published two reports. The first one is called All Hands on Deck. Um, and it included interviews with 82 senior shipping leaders from right across the sector to understand what they see as the greatest barriers to decarbonization and what solutions they thought the highest priority. And we've recently followed that up with a second report called Setting Shell's Course to describe mm -hmm. our preferred decarbonization pathway, the actions that we're taking as a company to lower emissions today, and how we hope to accelerate the industry's transition to net zero emissions as soon as possible. But the one thing that's come out loud and clear, and that's whether it is um, safety or decarbonization, um, one thing from all of our conversation is that progress, it requires collaboration. And I'll, I'll come back to that maybe a little bit later. But, but Ted, from your side, um, how do you see the financial market's role going forward in working with industry and uh, particularly in supporting this um, strong drive that, that we all are seeing around decarbonization? Yeah. Well, I, I think the role of, of the financial markets will, will be critical. Um, you know, the, the, the financial markets allocate and, and price capital. Uh, shipping is a capital intensive industry, as we all know. Uh, and I think certainly from conversations we're having and and listening to other people speak in different fora such as this, uh, there's there's no doubt that the ship owner is aware that the um, not only the it, it's not necessarily about the cost of capital, but actually the availability of capital. Um, 
so that that tells me, and I think it's quite consistent with the conversations we have with investors, that uh, that the financial markets, you know, and, and the banks, the, the investors, the private investors, public investors, um, they have an increasing focus on, generally speaking, uh, ESG related issues, sustainability related issues, and then of course that all really funnels into the decarbonization drive for shipping, and and. Uh, they will they will be taking a hard look at, at what companies are doing and not doing, in in, in deciding uh, if, if they are going to be prepared to allocate capital. So um, I, I think um, I, I think it's quite critical. I think there's a short term, you know, um, there's a short term priority really being, you know, pushing the pushing the drive to use and, and increase the use of existing technologies to. You know, to reduce emissions, and, and then as we get to some of the solutions that, that will come, uh, helping to be part of financing the investments in the new, you know, kind of zero emission vessels that uh, you know, I think we all expect are going to be part of, of the industry's future. So, quite an important role, I would say. Mm. Yeah, very much so. Um, I thought the uh, the all hands on deck report was made, made a very interesting read. It was very comprehensive. Um, there's a there's a million questions uh, that, that I would love to ask coming out of that, but we don't we don't have time for that. Um, and of course, it, it's a relatively new document, new piece of work, um, and it lays out a lot of you know kind of challenges and recommendations for how to you, you know start start acting. Uh, and I wonder if you could just maybe focus on on one or two of the more critical you know steps that need to be taken now to, to get going for the industry, and and, and maybe what what progress has been made to date on, 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 on those, albeit that it's quite a fresh document. Yeah, thanks, Ted. Um, so the one thing that, that we can all do um, is, is really push forward with operational efficiencies. Um, it doesn't matter which fuel comes out, shall I say, as the uh, preferred lower emissions fuel in the future. Um, one thing we can do to reduce emissions is to reduce the, the performance, uh, improve the performance on our ships. Mm -hmm. uh, so we see what we call energy efficient technologies as the foundation block for, for any, anything in decarbonization, um, doesn't matter whatever the pathway. And the great thing about this, um, Ted, is that they've got a strong business case because mm -hmm. um, what happens is that they reduce fuel costs which reduce emissions. So as a result of that, obviously you reduce the fuel costs, you reduce, um, reduce the running costs, and, and um, as a result of that, there's a strong business case. And certainly in Shell, we, we've seen some very handsome returns. Right. Um, so just a few, a few examples. Um, so firstly, what we're doing is we've, we're fully digitalizing our ships. So we're drawing off of our ships 500 data points a second, um, and then analyzing those in real time and then working with the, the, um, the shipping company, the, the, if it's chartered or our own ship's captains, um, to optimize the performance. So optimize the performance of the engines, uh, optimize um, the routing of the ship, et cetera. Um, and then some other things we're doing is we're installing air lubrication. So this is um, a stream of bubbles, which is pumped under the hull, reduces friction, and we are seeing uh, reductions of 7% in emissions and hence fuel. Trialing wind technology, um, both sails and, and also um, spinning vertical cylinders called um, Fletner rotors. Um, and there we're seeing an 8% emissions reduction. And then we've also developed um, a, a low cost and quick um, deployment of a software that um, can reduce um, emissions by 7%. We've called it jaws just add water and we've also um, made this available to the wider shipping industry so you can start to see when you add these up um, you can get to reasonably high percentage reductions in emissions um, without shall i say doing too much um, right. in terms of, of what we've got available hmm. um, there's also, uh, while we're developing those new fuels, uh, LNG is the lowest emissions marine fuel currently available at scale. And of course, we've got 50 years uh, operational experience, so we understand it well. We're doubling in Shell our existing LNG bunkering infrastructure uh, by the mid 2020s. 
And we've recently um, signed for a further eight LNG carriers. And these will be the lowest emission ships uh, in their class on the water. And in total on these uh, LNG ships that, um, that I talk about, we can see a reduction of 60% against the 2008 IMO baseline. Right. So this is just with energy efficient technologies and LNG. So, so a pretty, um, a pretty good, um, good start, shall I say. And we are looking to reduce that even further. Um, the other thing that we, we've just signed up to is the sea charter, cargo charter. So this is where we've committed to measure and publish our emissions data. So with this, we can start to understand our emissions and start to learn from each other if we can share that across the industry. And I think that will have a positive, um, positive benefit too. So some key areas that, um, that we're taking forward already, um, and, and we can come on to maybe some of the other things we're, we're doing later. But, um, but before that, Ted, um, one of the other things in our all hands on deck research was the need for the ship owner to take a long term perspective on the investments, mm -hmm. um, particularly around the IMO decarbonisation objectives. Um, how do you see this um, with regard to financial markets and financial returns for investors? You know, I think that's a that's a that's a challenging question. Um, uh, I, I, I do believe that that the I think one of the things your your paper said was that the ship owner, you know, there needs to be some incentives for the uh, for the ship owner to, you know, to uh, to make the investment decision, to have the conviction to make the investment decision. Um, you know, I, I I believe the customer plays an important role in 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 creating that um, that. Um, that potential, uh, and and for most shipping companies, the customer is 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 the charterer. So I, I I do think, you know, a a collaboration. You used that word a few moments ago, and it's a it's it's a good word. Uh, I think a collaboration uh, between ship owners and charters will be a critical element here. Um, I also think of you know long term perspective from the point of view of um, you know, I think shipping, shipping comp the public who listen shipping companies today are struggling with their valuations. I don't get any secret. Um, you know, there's there's been a kind of a series of shocks over the over the last you know couple of years that have that have kind of I think just focused investors' attention on 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 the cyclicality and the volatility of the industry, and and that's not something that they 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 particularly like. Um, you know, I do think that. There's a growing trend or, or consensus in the capital markets that um, doing the right thing uh, when it comes to issues like ESG and sustainability um, do create value, do create returns over time. Um, I think there's been a lot of talk around, you know, shifting mindsets in, in, in companies generally, not shipping companies, but, but companies generally, you know, to, to stakeholder capitalism as opposed to shareholder capitalism. Um, and I think the long-term perspective is, 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 is consistent with a more stakeholder uh, capitalism perspective. Um, I think ship owners need to be disciplined when it comes to capital allocation. Um, I think they need to be transparent about their, their policies around these issues and uh, clear on what kind of actions they're taking to follow them up. Um, providing data, you mentioned data, providing transparency. You know, I think, I think all, of these, all of these elements are part of providing the opportunity for a ship owner to take a long-term perspective because while he's, while he's doing that, he's, he's also beginning to create a better return, you know, for, for the investor. But look, the ship owner, the ship owner needs um, clear parameters. It needs, they need a level playing field. Um, it, it, again, in order to have that conviction to make, to make these sizable investments. Uh, I think some of the things you spoke about in, in your last comments, you know, they're, 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 they're more of the, the incremental using ex existing technologies and data to, to continue to grind out improvements and reductions in emissions. 
Uh, and that's an important part of it, there's no doubt. Um, but the real, the real nut, I think, as we know, is really investing in the next, in the next, um, you know, generation of vessels uh, that are that are really zero emission vessels. So, um, you know, that level playing field needs to be out there, and I, that, I think that's part of the of the effort that your your all hands on deck paper really speaks to being needed to create that. Your, the word was ecosystem, so that you know everybody is is kind of operating on. on on the same on the same basis and with the same objectives because I, you know it's only fair for the ship owners if they're going to make these big investment uh, decisions that they they have a reasonable basis for feeling that they can generate a turn for their investors i mean that's you know it's it's you can talk about stakeholder capitalism you can talk about shareholder capitalism but at the end of the day if they can't create a return for investment it's going to be difficult for them to attract the the capital they need to uh, to, 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 to fund these activities yeah. i hope that wasn't too long-winded <laughs> We can kind of go around and around on these things, but uh, um, that's a challenge for shipping. It's 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 and, and it always has been, you know, from a from a public investor perspective, you know, the long term perspective versus the uh, you know the investors' need or, or, or desire for returns. Um, okay, um, I talk about what. What what Shell is really doing is is you know obviously what you're doing you're doing for your own fleet. You mentioned in your last comments that you were also involved with with, with charters and in in, in, in in looking at their emissions data on the ships you're charting from them. What 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 is you know what are some of the you know the the broader roles that Shell is playing you know towards the industry as a whole to help you know drive this thing forward. I mean you're obviously a major charter. You know how do you how do you use that role to help, you know, yeah. push push yeah. things push things forward? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll come on to that in a moment, but but I don't want to lose um, lose the uh, importance of safety because um, yep. at the end of the day, um, you know, it's our seafarers that are, are running our ships, and we need to make sure that we look after them and that they're in um, a good um, a good place to do that. So, um, some of the things we've been doing around safety is we've been um, really looking at uh, what causes incidents and it's become pretty well known that not just in shipping but also aviation road rail that um, human error is um, is the big contributor and we've done a big big piece of um, research between um, the seafarer well-being and human error and um, you know, it clearly demonstrates that if you've got seafarers who are in a good physical and mental health, um, there'll be fewer accidents and also a more motivated crew. And they will want to do a great job for the company. And that's going to be very important as we, um, as we change some of the parameters on our ships. We've developed a series of programs um, which we've made available to industry to really try and get under the neath uh, this um, seafarer well-being and human error aspect. I mentioned Together in Safety earlier, this is a coalition um, with members from across the shipping sector, so that's um, all of, all of the, the shipping groups. Um, we're sharing best practice, safety critical data, and we're moving on to analyze data. And I really think that um, this will help to, um, to reduce incidents and make early interventions. So just moving on to decarbonization, uh, we've taken a leading position in our research and development into zero emission fuels and technologies. Um, we looked at each of those new fuels and um, it's fair to say there are challenges with them all. Um, whether it's toxicity, whether it's energy density, high end ignition energy, um, yeah, it, there are issues and it will take a considerable amount of time, Ted, to understand these aspects such that we can safely and efficiently use them on an everyday basis. Mm -hmm. and what we're seeing, and um, you saw it in the report, is that hydrogen um, is the fuel that we think, at least, has got the highest likelihood of success. And, and the reason for this is that it's being developed for use by other sectors. So um, airlines, railroad, heavy industry so that shipping will not have to bear all of the costs of the production and distribution infrastructure. And of course, that's been put by some at um, getting on for $2 trillion, which is uh, yep. quite considerable. Big so a couple of examples. 
One is in the port of Rotterdam. So Shell has been working on a large scale electrolysis project for the provision of hydrogen to our refinery there. And that will start to develop that crucial hydrogen fuel infrastructure linked to ports. Um, the second one is that we're in a consortium on a project called Hystra. This is working on the design and construction of a hydrogen supply vessel. Um, and we will manage as Shell that vessel when it's completed next year. So we'll be able to really, really understand um, mm. large scale distribution of hydrogen. We also believe in fuel cells um, having a huge mm. potential. They're far more efficient in terms of energy um, through the cell than an internal combustion engine. Yep. And um, we are cons uh, launching a consortium later this year to demonstrate their suitability because at the moment they've been used onshore, but of course on a ship with movement um, and in more, more challenging uh, environmental conditions, we've got to make sure that they are robust. Hmm. Now the great thing is that fuel cells can operate today using LNG. So that allows us to develop that technology and benefit from the lower emissions. And then as we scale up those new fuels, such as hydrogen, we can switch to them later. Mm -hmm. We're also leading the advocacy with the IOM, uh, IMO sorry, to regulate for a net zero emission shipping by 2050. And we think that that, that can be achieved. And we both spoke about collaboration and it's going to be collaboration, as I say, on a scale never yet seen before. So it's not just about collaboration in shipping, it's yep. across into aviation road heavy industry. And this is where Shell can play a key role because we operate in those sectors and we have links and customer relationships in those sectors and we can bridge those to the benefit um, of the shipping industry. Yeah. And so um, finally, Ted, one of, one of the things you mentioned, which uh, really interested me, was um, the, this about sustainability and uh, ESG, as you call it, environmental, social and governance, um, in, and the importance of those in making investment decisions. And I just wondered whether you could just expand on that a little bit, because um, it's something that, um, that, that we'll have to take uh, a lot of consideration yeah. within our investments. Yeah, yeah I, it's, it's, it's something that you know, I said a year ago in this conference that that ESG was 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 becoming something that was was yeah. was topical. That was a part of the conversation. I feel like it's advanced light years in the 12 months <laughs> since then. It's it's really uh, it's really top of mind now. I think for for investors, for banks, um, and 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 frankly, it, it is for shipping companies as well. Uh, it's it's, um, it's 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 had a very I would say. Um, it, 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 there's been a much more active focus on it in Europe uh, over the last couple of years, and I think Europe is probably ahead of, of where we are in the U.S. There's a, you know, there's there's new requirements coming in in the EU, EU for investors where they need to be reporting data on their investment portfolios in terms of how those portfolios are performing according to a a set of criteria related to to sustainability. Um, you know, we definitely see in the U.S. investors being much more focused on this issue, um, you know. For for some, it's it's a very binary issue. If it's if if if, if you're connected with fossil fuels, it, 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 the, the decision is a no-go. But I think what we see is that for the for the, the very large majority, you know, in, in, in investing in, in brown industries to finance the transition, uh, that's investable. And, and, and I think there 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 is there is investor support interest, you know, for, for those types of investments. And of course, you know, the transition is going to be critical. Fossil fuels are, they're not, they're not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, the transport of them is not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, I, I only, I only see that growing. Um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it, yeah. it's kind of back to my initial yeah. comments that the financial markets will, yeah. will play a, play a big role in this, in this process. So, yeah, I agree. With, I agree. Yeah. With you. Um, our time is up, I think, which is. Um, a I think pity. our time is um, up. I, I have really yeah. enjoyed talking to you as always. And um, we, till the next time, till the next time. Thank you very much. This has been, this, this has been terrific. Um, I think, you know, obviously what you guys are doing as a company uh, is, 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 is exemplary. Um, we've all got a challenge ahead of us and, 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 and I hope we're all, we're all going to be a part of it. 
Uh, I think certainly from DNB's perspective, we see it as a real opportunity to assist our clients, both 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 shipping companies and investors, to get smarter around the specific shipping issues. Um, um, you know, investing in the transition uh, and and helping helping uh, helping helping the industry uh, meet its goals. So we're in it together. Yeah, collaboration. Anyway, there you go. There you go. Graham, thank you. It's good thank to see you. you and good to talk with you. Take Thank care. you. Thanks, Ted. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.